1. Holiness of nature. Some consider this only as a qualification for his office and due performance of it in human nature, whereby he was capable of yielding sinless obedience to the law and was qualified as an high priest to offer himself a spotless sacrifice and to be a proper advocate for sinners, being Jesus Christ the righteous. But this not only fitted him for his work, but made him suitable to us. Such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless. The law required an holy nature in conformity to it. It is wanting in us, it is found in Christ, who is of God made unto us sanctification. See more of this under the fourth head. 2. The obedience of Christ's life, commonly called his active obedience. Christ was sinless and perfect. His whole life was a perfect conformity to the law and was a continued series of holiness and obedience. The holiness of his nature appeared in all his actions throughout his whole state of humiliation, from his birth to his death, in all which he was the representative of his people. What he did, he did in their room instead, and therefore was reckoned as if done by them, and is imputed to them as their righteousness. There are some divines who exclude the active obedience of Christ from being any part of the righteousness by which men are justified. They allow it is a condition requisite in him as mediator, qualifying him for his justice, but deny that it is the matter of justification or that it is imputed and reckoned for righteousness to men. They suppose that Christ was obliged to this obedience for himself as a creature, and that it is unnecessary as to his people because his sufferings and death are sufficient for their justification. But, 1. Though the human nature of Christ being a creature and so considered as subject to the law and obliged to obedience, yet it was not obliged to a course of obedience in such a low, mean, suffering state, being entitled to glory and happiness from the moment of its union to the Son of God. This was voluntary. Besides, the human nature being taken into personal union with the Son of God, the person of Christ, who was not subject to the law, but was above it, the Lord of it, and was an act of his will to submit to it, and a wonderful instance of his condescension it was. Moreover, as Christ, being made of a woman, and made under the law, he was made both for the sake of his people. He became man for their sake, to us, or for us, a child is born, Isaiah 9, 6, and for their sake he became subject to the law, that he might yield obedience to it in their room instead, and that he might redeem them from the curse of it. And this was the kind and gracious design of his divine Father in sending him in likeness of sinful flesh, that he might obey and suffer for them. That so the whole righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in them. Galatians 4, verse 4. Romans 8, verse 3 and 4. 2. Without the active obedience of Christ, the law could not be satisfied, the language of which is do and live. And unless its precepts are obeyed, as well as its penalties endured, it cannot be satisfied. And unless it be satisfied, there can be no justification by it. Christ, as a surety, in the room instead of his people, must do both. Must both obey the precepts of the law and bear its penalty. His submitting to the one, without conforming to the other, is not sufficient. One debt is not paid by another. His paying of the debt of punishment did not exempt from obedience, as the paying of the debt of obedience did not exempt from punishment. Christ did not satisfy the whole law by either of them separately, but by both conjointly. By his sufferings and death he satisfied the threatenings, the sanction of the law, but not the precepts of it thereby. And by his active obedience he satisfied the precepts part of the law, but not the penal part. But by both he satisfied the whole of the law and made it honourable. 3. It is by a righteousness that men are justified. 
and that is the righteousness of Christ. Now, righteousness, strictly speaking, lies in doing, in actual obedience to the commands of the law. This shall be our righteousness, if we observe to do. Deuteronomy 6.25 Christ's righteousness lay in doing, not in suffering. All righteousness, as one says, is either an habit or an act, but sufferings is neither, and therefore not righteousness. No man is righteous because he is punished. If so, the devils, undamned in hell, would be righteous in proportion to their punishment. The more severe their punishment, and the more grievous their torments, the greater their righteousness must be. If there is any righteousness in punishment, it must be by the punisher and not in the punished. If therefore men are justified by the righteousness of Christ, imputed to them, it must be by his active obedience, and not merely by his sufferings and death, because these, though they free from death, yet strictly speaking, do not make men righteous. 4. It is expressly said that by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Romans 5.19 Which cannot be meant of the sufferings and death of Christ, because, properly speaking, they are not his obedience, but the effect of it. Besides, the antithesis in the next determines the sense of the words. For if by one man's actual disobedience, which was the case, many were made sinners, so by the rule of opposition, the one man's actual obedience, which is Christ's, many are made righteous or justified. 5. The reward of life is not promised to suffering, but to doing. And the law says, do this and live. It promises life, not to him that suffers the penalty, but to him that obeys the precepts. There never was a law, as an excellent divine observed, even among men, either promising or declaring a reward due to the criminal, because he had undergone the punishment of his crimes. Christ's sufferings and death, being satisfactory to the conformatory or threatening part of the law, are reckoned to us for justification. That so, we may be freed and discharged from the curse of it, and from hell and wrath to come. But as they do not constitute us righteous, they do not entitle us to eternal life. But the active obedience, or righteousness of Christ, being imputed to us, is unto justification of life, or what gives title to eternal life. 3. Nevertheless, the sufferings and death of Christ, or what is commonly called the passive obedience, are requisite to our justification before God. Passive obedience is a phrase that may be objected to as not accurate, being a seeming contradiction in terms. Suffering and obedience convey different ideas and belong to different classes. Suffering belong to the predicament or class of passion. Obedience to that of action. Yet, as Christ's sufferings flow from his obedience and were the effect of his submission to his Father's will, with respect to which he said, Not my will, but thine be done. And as he was obedient throughout his life, in all the actions and in all the sufferings of it, even to the moment of his death, and was also obedient in death, laying down his life at the command received from his Father. For, though a son yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered, and was even active in his sufferings. He laid down his life himself, he poured out his soul unto death, and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice for sin. Considering these things, the phrase passive obedience may be admitted of, especially as it is well known what is meant by it, the voluntary sufferings and death of Christ, which are most certainly ingredients to the justification of a sinner. It may be asked, if Christ was the representative of his people in his active obedience, which constitutes them just or righteous, and is their justification of life, or what entitles to eternal life, what need was there of his sufferings and death? To which it may be answered, that it was necessary that Christ, as the surety and representative of his people, should satisfy the law in everything it could require of them, both as creatures and as sinful creatures. 
as creatures the law could require of them purity of nature and perfect obedience to it which were in their first parents but were lost by them and are wanting in them as sinful creatures it could require of them to endure the penalty of it christ now as the surety of his people represented them as creatures in the purity of his nature and in the perfection of his life or in his active obedience and presented that to the law for them which it could require of them as creatures as it is certain he represented them in his sufferings and death hence he is said to die for them that is in their room and stead and they to be crucified and buried with him in these he represented them as sinful creatures and bore the penalty or curse of the law and in both obediences he satisfied the whole in it and as by the one they are freed from death the sanction of the law so by the other they are entitled to life and by both christ is the fulfilling end of the law for righteousness unto them for that the sufferings and death of christ as well as his active obedience are required to the complete justification of a sinner appears one that without these the law could not be satisfied and its demands answered and unless it is satisfied there can be no justification by it and it cannot be satisfied unless its penalty is endured four two the law in case of disobedience to it threatened with death and death is the just wages and due demerit of sin and therefore this must be endured either by the sinner or a surety for him or else he cannot be discharged by the law three the justification of a sinner is expressly ascribed to the blood of christ which is put for the whole of his sufferings and death romans five verse nine four justification proceeds upon redemption being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in christ jesus romans three verse twenty four now redemption is by the blood of christ and through his sufferings and death ephesians one seven one peter three eighteen nineteen revelations five nine five it is upon the foot of christ's satisfaction that justification takes place and satisfaction is made by christ doing and suffering all the law requires and so as by his obedience likewise by his blood and death to which it is more frequently ascribed peace is made by his blood reconciliation by his death atonement expiation by his sacrifice which is of a sweet smelling savour unto god colossians one twenty romans five ten hebrews nine twenty six ephesians five two six the complete justification of a sinner does not seem to be finished by christ until his resurrection and after his obedience and sufferings of death for he was delivered for our offences and was raised again for our justification romans four twenty five in short the righteousness by which we are justified as dr amis says is not to be sought for in different operations of christ but arises from his whole obedience both active and passive which is both satisfactory and meritorious and frees from condemnation and death and adjudges and entitles to eternal life even as one and the same disobedience of adam stripped us of original righteousness and rendered us obnoxious to condemnation so much for the matter of justification secondly the form of it is imputation or the manner in which the righteousness of christ is made over to a sinner and it becomes his is by imputing it to him even as david describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputeth righteousness without works romans four six the words used both in hebrew and greek and signify to reckon repute estimate attribute and place something to the account of another as when the apostle said to philomen concerning onesimus if he hath wronged thee or owed thee aught put it on my account let it be reckoned or imputed to me so when god is said to impute the righteousness of christ to any the sense is that he reckons it as theirs being wrought out for them 
and account them righteous by it, as though they have performed it in their own persons, and that it is by the righteousness of Christ imputed to his people that they are justified. It is clear when it is observed. 1. That those whom God justifies are in themselves ungodly, for God justifieth the ungodly. Romans chapter 4 verse 5. If ungodly, then without a righteousness. And if without a righteousness, then if they are justified, it must be by a righteousness imputed to them, or placed to their account, which can be no other than the righteousness of Christ. 2. They that are justified are justified either by an inherent or by an imputed righteousness, not by an inherent one, for that is imperfect, and so not justifying, and one, for that is imperfect, and so not justifying, and if not by an inherent righteousness, then it must be by one imputed to them, for there remains no other. 3. The righteousness by which any are justified is the righteousness of another, and not their own, even the righteousness of Christ. Not having mine own righteousness, says the Apostle, Philomus 3, nine. Now, the righteousness of another cannot be made a man's, or he be justified by it, any other way than by an imputation of it to him. For the same way that Adam's sin became the sin of his posterity, or they were made sinners by it, the same way Christ's righteousness becomes his people, or they are made righteous by it. Now the former is by imputation, and so is the latter. As by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, that is, by the imputation of it to them. So, by the obedience of one, shall many be made righteous, that is, by placing it to their account. Romans chapter 5, verse 19. 5. The same way that the sins of Christ's people became his, his righteousness becomes theirs. Now, their sins became Christ's by imputation only. The Father laid them on him, or made him to meet upon him, imputed them to him, placed them to his account, and he took them upon him, and looked upon himself as answerable to justice for them. And so in the same way his righteousness is made over to and put upon his people. For he, who knew no sin, was made sin for us, by imputation, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, accounted righteous in him, through his righteousness imputed. 2 Corinthians 5.21 now, there are several things which are said of this imputed righteousness of Christ which serve greatly to recommend it and set forth the excellency of it as, one, that it is called the righteousness of God, Romans 1, 17 and 3, 22, being wrought by Christ, who is God as well as man, approved and accepted of by God and freely imputed by him to believers as their justifying righteousness. 2. It is called the righteousness of one, Romans 5, verse 18, of one of the persons in the Trinity, the Son of God, of him who, though he has two natures united in him, is but one person, and who is the one common head of all his seed. And though his obedience or righteousness serves for many, it is the obedience of one, Romans 5, verse 19. And therefore they are justified, not partly by their own obedience and partly by Christ, but by his only. 3. It is called the righteousness of the law. That's Romans 8, verse 4. Being wrought by Christ in conformity to the law, so that his righteousness is a legal righteousness, as performed by Christ, being every way commensurate to the demands of it. Though evangelical, as made over to his people and revealed in the gospel, for it is manifested without the law, though witnessed by the law and the prophets.